Well, we are up to, uh, as you know, we go back and forth Old and New Testament. And uh, we've been doing this now for some time because we're all the way up to Second Chronicles in the Old Testament. And we're moving well in the New Testament. We're at the end of, near the end of uh, Second uh, Timothy. And, uh, but it'll still be, bef- I think that Jesus will come for us before this thing's over. But <laughs> and we continue to plow along. And we are up to the last, um, the next to the last chapter of, of Second Chronicles. And I want to kind of contextualize that for you. And by looking at chapter four, uh, 34 of it, first of all. So we have this... Um, this theme of Josiah. So we, I want to talk about the theme and purpose of Second Chronicles. And again, pull out some things, because what I love about the scriptures is it's alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's able to really penetrate, and it's a moral mirror, as James 1 describes it. It reveals us. And so in looking at the conditions and the folly and the futility of people's and enterprises and endeavors to try to find meaning without God, which is so often the case, they end up in dead ends and ultimately deprive themselves of joy. So our call actually is, again, to be fl- to flourish in the fields of God. And though we are in a sinful and painful world, it's a fallen world, nevertheless, we are, of all people, ones who can laugh because we see at the end we're part of a comedy, by which I mean it's going to end well. Tragic, the pain in, the, in, this, in this season of life. But ultimately, God redeems what he allows for his children. And all, sh- all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, as Julian of Nor- Norwich put it. And that is a better way of saying it than this too shall pass. You see, I'd rather say all shall be well than this too shall pass. So there's nothing that happens in this world that can defeat the joy that is prepared for us, for those who know God and are called according to his purpose, though we will go through much adversity and affliction, and you know that, because the three things that really guide us and draw us in our own spiritual growth will be a combination of the communication with God and his word, and also um, to not only listen to his word, but also um, to pray it back to him. That's why I love him, to prayer, because it's a way of praying, combining those two disciplines, Praying scripture back to God is a good way to go, combining prayer and scripture. But then there's a third thing that God uses consistently for our growth, and there's no getting around it. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, establish you. That was going to be the name of my book that became Shaped by Suffering. I like that's a better name. But after you suffered for, for a little while was going to be my name. And it tells us two things. Didn't say if, after. I've told you this before. That suffering is a, is a, a required course. It's not an option and not an elective in the university of life. And that is, it is necessary. But, the, but for a little while, the second thing it tells you, you're going to go through that. And it's going to be, there's no way to become Christ like, like Christ without going through the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to that. No way of doing it. There's no way of averting it because it is pain that actually drives us to Jesus and calls us to depend more and more on the Holy Spirit. And so the idea, though, it's only for a little while. I consider the suffering of this present time aren't even worth comparing with the glory to be revealed to us. So the joy will endure. It won't be very long before we will be together in the Father's house. And you're going to look back in this moment and you'll remember it. And you're going to remember that right now we have our hopes and our fears and our dreams and our desires and our delights. But at the same time, what I want you to desire more than anything else is the one thing most needful, the pearl of great price, the treasure hidden in the field. That is to say, the one thing most needful is what do you seek? And you seek because you're wired for God. You're wired for, he's made you in his image and therefore nothing less than infinity and eternity is big enough for you. Nothing less than absolute infinity and eternity. And if you set your heart on something less than that, this is why I use my, remember my 90, sec, my 90 years, then my, my 90 days, and then you have 90 uh, uh, minutes, and then you have 90 seconds. What's on your mind? And where do I go with that? If you, have, if you had 90 seconds left, what would be on your mind? And if it's not Jesus, it's the wrong thing. You may love your family, but you're going to love them less 
than if you love him more than your family. So he will brook no rival. Do you love me more than these? But at the same time, to love him most is to energize and animate and empower. Good three E's there. <laughs> I'll do my alliteration. Energize. <laughs> I forgot what I said, but um, <laughs> I realize why, because animate isn't a knee. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just caught myself. But the point is, it's to empower a perspective that will endure forever. Let's go into our, into our book now. But uh, this, you're going to see these lessons from this book writ large in your life. And again, it's not just history. This is alive with meaning because it's a, God's revelation is, was revealed in space-time history. And so what we see is uh, a purpose. The book of Second Chronicles is really a topical history, as we said, of the end of the United Kingdom, which was um, ended with Solomon. So Saul, David, and Solomon. And that uh, then, and also then after that, the uh, end of the kingdom of Judah. And it brings us to that point there. And it's more than just some, some kind of a historical annal. It is a divine editorial on the spiritual characteristics of the Davidic dynasty. So this is not like um, Samuel and Kings. It's, it's somewhat different because it's focusing on certain themes that are very evident. It focuses on the southern kingdom, whereas Kings had the kings of both North Judah uh, and, and also Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel and then the southern kingdom of Judah. But here it only focuses on the southern kingdom of Israel because that's where the messianic line would be. And so most of the kings failed to realize um, the, that apart from its true mission as a covenant nation called to bring other people to the living God. Judah had no calling, no destiny, no hope of becoming great on its own. You can immediately see that application to your life. If you try to live in life that's apart from and separated from, whereby you make a com component of Christ is only a component or a compartment of your life, it is not the full way of life that he's called us to pursue, which is to be all in without any reserve, without any um, um, holding back. So what do you seek? Remember the three questions I ask you to invite, I invite you to ask. Try to do it at least once an hour. You can do that. Ah, I can't do that. That's just for the professionals. Um, and what do you get, where, do you, where do we get this crazy clergy uh, secular distinction? You know, uh, we are all in full-time Christian ministry. It's just the difference, only difference between you and me is how I'm being paid. You see, but we're all involved. Every one of you is involved or is called to a vocare, a vocation, and that calling transcends your career. It is a bigger thing than that. God embeds you in various conditions in life, in the marketplace. He embeds you in, in relationships where you can do your work with excellence and dignity and skill and integrity and character. And it, it, it provides a vision for people, a credibility, a place where you then have an impact on lives and it raises people's questions. What is it about you that you have a reason for your, what's your reason for your hope? So again, these are good kings that it focuses on who did have their hope in the right place. And that's the difference there. But there was growing apostasy that would actually um, um, occur as a result of judgment because it, so it focuses on those who maintain the, proper serve, maintain the proper service of God and the attitude toward God, and uh, the times of spiritual reform, but with growing apostasy would still end it. And the theme that I want you to focus on in particular was going to be the temple, because that's been mainly, uh, a main emphasis. So that uh, David's preparation for the temple is, is found in, the, in First Chronicles. And remember, First and Second Chronicles were one book in the Hebrew. It was not to be divided at that time. So what you have here is much of the material found in 2 Samuel to um, 2 Kings was omitted in Chronicles because it doesn't develop this theme. So what we now see in here is the t central message is David's preparation for the construction and service of the temple. And then most of 2 Chronicles 1 to 9 focuses on the building and then the consecration of that temple, so it's very disproportionate in that amount. Then chapters 10 to 36 focuses on 
the uh, kings of Israel, in the, um, um, Judah rather, but they omit the kings of Israel. Again, they had no ties with the temple. And so preeminence is given to the reign also of, the, of Judah's temple restorers, and there were four of them. Asa, Jehosh Jehoshaphat, Joash, Hezekiah. Did I say four? There were five. Josiah. I'm just testing you out. But these are five kings who had a heart for, the, for God. Oh, that they would have a heart for the things that I'm calling them to do, that they would love me and do my commands. Then it would be well with them and with their children. So that if you want things to be well, pursue the thing that he calls you to be. Be his man. And then you discover that everything else finds its proper place. Too many of us find ourselves compartmentalized, where Christ is a component, but not the centrality of our life. And we need to make that our, our, our focal point in our lives as well. That is not just a component. The role of the temple, though, was huge because it was a symbol of God's presence. It was also a symbol of God's, of, of, of the high calling for his people. And it was a spiritual link as well that connected their past to their future. And so the loss of the temple then and the building of the second temple would be an important theme as well, because Ezra had a purpose here to encourage the people to accept the new temple, not nearly as magnificent as the great Solomonic temple. And yet a greater would come into that temple as Jesus would be the one who would illuminate that, but still to encourage them and God's faithfulness to see, remember your true calling and God's faithfulness in spite of your, your uh, low circumstances. The Davidic line, the temple and the priesthood, they're still yours. So then if we focus our attention on some of the keys to this, a priestly view of Judah becomes the, the key word for, for me. Um, it's, this is all from talk through the Bible. It's a book I did way back. It's hard to imagine. Oh, you know, I first came to Atlanta in summer of 79 to work with Walk Through the Bible. You know, many of you know this. They were going to be given the Biltmore Hotel to use as a school, and it was going to be a graduate school. I don't ever know what happened to all that. They would have had the dorm. They would have had the parking. They would have had the cafeteria. They would have the lecture hall, everything you needed. And it was a great faculty, and they had a great being, knowing, and doing uh, premise for their educational system. So I was very drawn to that graduate school. And then I come to Atlanta, and about three months later, I find out it's, they, he, they pulled the plug on it. So then my time with Walk Through the Bible, I spent three years um, from, from 1979 to 82. And in that time, time, I did some books for them. One of them was Talk to the Old Testament, another was Talk to the New Testament. I also book, did a book with Larry Moody called I'm Glad You Asked, dealing with the 12 basic questions during that time. And uh, then, it, that, so subsequent to that, my, my friend Bill Ibsen uh, turned all the images, all the chapters, every book into a visual presentation. That's what you're looking at here. They're all, they're all available on the website, but just to, to contextualize that. So we have a, one of the key verses in this book is often going to be quoted as, um, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. But then it's very much what's often overlooked is the temple context that's involved in here. There was only one theocratic covenant nation. And it wasn't America, it was Israel. Now, we can take certain principles, though, and to the, to the degree to which any people obey and build upon these truths, it's going to lead, uh, all things being equal, to something greater than they would have had otherwise. And certainly America was a unique situation in many ways, insofar as its constitution it was founded on a theistic platform. Some were deists, but at least it was an acknowledgement of God. And there, that was what I think gave him a greatness and led to a great missionary movement that God has used this nation and its relationship with Israel was very, very significant as well. So we see now when we look at this, and I can't watch the news anymore, it's too depressing. Um, I, I, I pretty much know what's going on, uh, but I don't need to get granular about it because to be honest with you, it's not a good use of my time. 
because we are commanded to whatever is true and right and honorable and, and lovely and pure and if, what is excellent, p worthy of praise. Set your mind, dwell on these things. I, last time I checked, the news was just the opposite of those things in Philippians 4, 8. Per the precise, perfect opposite. So how do we live without wringing our hands? I set my mind in the things above and focus on God's purpose. And the fact is that we actually are in the days very much like what Jesus described before his second coming. So instead of wringing my hands, I'm anticipating his coming, and therefore I live with urgency without anxiety is my combination. Have a sense of urgency, but don't be anxious. You know you've been granted enough time to accomplish God's mission and purpose for you in this world. And as a consequence, you have to ask yourself every day and ask the Lord, I want to be your man this day, so what do I seek? Who do, you, who do I say you are? Do I love you more than these? And that's a great, great way of recalibrating your life. And then remember the other three things that I often throw in with that, because every day I need to remind myself, because otherwise I'll be sucked into the morass of this culture. And so I have to remind myself, number one, to trust the Father, number two, to abide in the Son, and number three, to walk by, that spirit, by the Spirit. And that Trinitarian formula is a great way of seeing. So if I am doubting God, if I am questioning Him, I'm not trusting Him. See, if I'm asking too many whys, and you understand if you're wise that you're never going to get the why. So wisdom means you stop asking for it, for, for the whys of the world, and understand the wisdom which comes from above is, is a different wisdom than, than that which comes from, above, from below. So there's all things being equal. Any nation, any enterprise that would do this, any person would be blessed in that respect. Um, but the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart and is loyal to him. Unfortunately, Asa uh, put his um, heart on, uh, on armies and he got his eyes off God. And so you've done foolishly and now you're going to have wars. But the idea of his eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth. He knows those who are his. And so he calls us and then connects us to the people that he wants us to be agents of grace in their lives. Keep chapter is 34, which we saw two weeks ago, because it dealt with just the idea of re reforms and re revivals. And we saw the Je revival, the reform of Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joash, Hezekiah, and now Josiah. So now we see this whole idea of how jo under Josiah, remember the book of the law was found, the book, the God's word, his Torah, had been lost effectively. How did that happen? We're not talking about, you know, I, a lot of people, it's, it's fascinating. I, I, I go to my sister's house, for example. I was there to celebrate the, the baptism of my brother-in-law, Wayne. It's an amazing thing. At about 80 years old, the guy comes to faith in Christ. God got his attention when he, the Jeep flipped over and uh, he should have died, broke his neck. And that got his attention. But there are other things that were getting it. God was gracing him. And many people were praying for Wayne. And ultimately, um, he comes to faith in Christ. I gave him a copy of Jesus in his own words, and he wanted extra copies of that. But it's kind of a fascinating thing how you, you go there and you see these, these celebrations. And we need to recognize that there are um, there's ways in which we can honor God in all kinds of details of our lives. So. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to see those, 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 those re revivals that take place. Um, chapter 34, Josiah, then is the, what we're focusing on there. And then uh, we're going to, another theme is going to be the contribution. It's more history, um, really more just about than any other Old, Old Testament book, because it begins with Adam in their genealogies, and it ends with the decree of Cyrus in 535 BC. In this respect, then, is more history. And it, it discusses as well the, uh, the period from David to the captivity of Judah and looks at the reigns of 21 kings and one queen. Um, and as for the time it was written, um, it was taught, taught lessons in the past. It illustrated God's faithfulness in the present. That is to say, the return from captivity, the building of their temple. And then also the fulfillment of God's promises in the future, the messianic line. And again, you and I have cause to recall and thank God and review our past 
where we were before we knew him, and now what he's done in our past since we've known him. He's, he's given you a history, a sacred history. And it's a good thing to see that, how lives affect and touch each other. But he also calls us to a, to a present where we practice his presence in now and recognize that we can also have a hope, hope for the future. And there are firm and clear promises that God has made that uh, ultimately our, our well-being will be found in him. So with that in mind, then, we can be grateful and have a perspective on our past, present, and future, which is critical. Um, the um, Chronicle of the Temple, then, it's a book. The book surveys its conception of the temple under David, then its construction and consecration under Solomon, and then its corruption and cleansing the kings of Judah, and then the conflagration, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. That's a bit of a force, that force C for the alliteration. I, ad I fully admit that. Sometimes it's a force. This was one. But nevertheless, um, and how Christ is seen in this. And so it's critical to see that God is sovereign over history. If he's sovereign and holds all things together in this cosmos as he does, I think he can manage our lives as well. And so the mind mindset of the uh, messianic line the throne of David has been destroyed, but the line of David uh, remains. And that's very important for us to see. The throne is gone now, but the line continues. And so we see the fulfillment in, is going to be in Christ. And so we have the Matthew and Luke 3 genealogies. What's interesting, the last book of the Hebrew Bible is Chronicles. And so these texts then really read right into the, the genealogies in the Gospels as well. There's a perfect seamless connection there. And they all prefigure Christ so that when we see in this place, there is one greater than the temple, pick, picking out that temple imagery. There's one who is now greater than the temple. Destroy this temple. And he said, in three days, I will raise it up. And then there's another application of it as well, that it, in Revelation 21, he replaces the temple. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So then we will be in, immersed in his immediacy, in his presence. It's hard for me to conceive all these things. Uh, when I see that the infinite and eternal God, the infinite word who created all things, in which we, the more I learn about this natural world on the microcosm, the midicosm, and the macro, the more mysterious it's becoming. I've been looking at some creatures from in the deep, in the oceanic depths, that are just so bizarre and strange. What kind of one could even imagine such a creature? We're not, we're not creative enough, um, but it's an incredible to these bizarre wonders that God has made. And many questions I'm going to have for him, a lot of questions. But the more I have uh, a greater vision of him from the small, great to the small, and the more mystery I see in here, the more incredible it becomes. And science is a force multiplier that can be used for worship. The more amazed I am that he cares for us. And that is the amazing thought that the infinite word who spoke all things into being is also the one who inspired the word that points to the incarnate word, and now the incarnate word is the indwelling word, so that he's in you. So in a very real sense then, you are the holy place in your very heart of hearts then. He has put the Spirit of God, and it's the Spirit of God who would be in the holy place. And so you are in the most holy place in, in Christ Jesus. You're seated with him in the heavenly places. So you are now that, 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 that there's a vision of who you really are in this, in this world. So it's a wonderful way of, of seeing and beholding uh, our lives. Let's, let's go into our text then. To summarize where we were very quickly, it was about Josiah who um, then got rid of the altars and the ashram and tore everything down. He was very enthusiastic. He crushed everything. He repaired the temple. Again, an emphasis on the temple is very critical. And when they came to, and as they were repairing the temple, that's when they discovered the book of the law. And, this, and then they said, read it to me. And the king wanted it, and when he heard that, he tore his robe because he said, we're in trouble. We have violated the holiness of this one, and we will see his wrath as a consequence. It was a powerful thing to see. So he's, when they found that, they, they, he trembled. And this idea, the one who trembles at my word, who, who is humbles himself before me, go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book which has been found. Great is the wrath of the Lord which is poured out on us because our fathers have not observed the word of the Lord.
to do according to all that is written in this book. And it was incredible, as the king would go, so would the people. And so there was a revival in his time. But I've never known a revival to last beyond one generation. It's because God has no grandchildren. So the idea here is that you have this tremendous revival, and then when he's off the scene, four wicked kings after another, one after another, and it's the demise of the whole kingdom, and they go into captivity. It's a, it's a tragic thought. So the, 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 uh, the, he was tender before God, and so he had a good reign and, 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 uh, until the end, and um, Josiah removed all the abominations from all the lands belonging to the sons of Israel. And then throughout his lifetime, note that qualifier, throughout his lifetime, they didn't turn from following the Lord God. As soon as he went, as soon as it was replaced, then they would de decline. He celebrated the Passover, which is an astonishing thing, because all these years, centuries had gone before since they had celebrated the Passover. It's amazing. Central theme about the mandate of celebrating this Passover, and it was just basically regarded as an optional thing. Um, and I marvel at it. And so he celebrated, and they, they slaughtered the animals, and uh, it was an amazing thing that he did. Put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David of Israel, built. It will be a burden to your shoulders no longer, and serve the Lord your God and his people Israel. Prepare yourselves according to the writing of David, the king of Israel, according to the writing of his son Solomon. Stand in this holy place according to the sections of the father's household of your brethren, of the lay people, and according to their Levites by the division of their father's household. And so they would, so he called them to do this, and it was a powerful uh, leader in, in bringing them to a spiritual understanding that the only hope that you have of flourishing is if you actually follow the rule book, the guidebook. Life is complex. He should have given us an instruction manual. Well, he did. And the book is God's blueprint. And that was the metaphor I still remember on the night of my conversion in the, in uh, just, um, it was in June of 1967. And I still remember that's what hit me so hard. This book, I'd learned, I'd heard about it, read about it when I was a kid, went to school, church and all that, or learned verses, but I never really grasped until I came to know Jesus what it, what it meant. This book is God's blueprint. I got to learn what it teaches. That's why I ended up going to Dallas Seminary, and I knew I was supposed to go to that school. It was very, very clear, though uh, I was a, an odd one to go to that school, as many of you know. Um, I was in bad shape spiritually. <laughs> I was still uh, into Eastern mysticism, occultism. Um, I was an ardent evolutionist, and um, um, I also was still in psychedelic drugs. But apart from this, that, <laughs> apart from that, uh, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like the play? <laughs> I had no business being there. God has a wonderful sense of humor, and he put me in an exceedingly conservative environment. It was fabulous. I redefined what a coat and tie looked like. <laughs> And I was, my hair would continue to grow out, and it was <laughs> stories within stories. But I knew I was getting my, I had to go through a whole year of conscious worldview transition and was agonizing. But then it was like an epiphany. It was visceral, it was not just in cognitive, but everything came together about a year after it, was, after it started. And all of a sudden, it all meshed together. And I had a worldview for the first time that was comprehensive and cohesive, co coherent and clear and compelling. It was a powerful worldview and it changed everything. Everything made sense. And that's really what this book, was, that's, this, this book is about. So if I do well, if I will follow this and know what it means, the more you begin to realize it is a way of living and that all things being equal, even an unbeliever who follows the principles, let's say in Proverbs, would be better off than by far, because these are truths that do work. But of course, the best thing is to know him, the one who gave us this, and whose word is now within the believer, whose life is in us. The amazing co concept is that the, the mag majestic Lord God Almighty, the one who made the stars and the moon, the galaxies, is also the lover of your souls and now is in you. It's an amazing thought. So all these things pointed ahead to this idea of what the Passover would mean, and that, that ultimately Christ, our Passover, has died for us. So it anticipates the coming of the Messiah. They could have never dreamed, though, as their progress of revelation continued, they could have never dreamed 
that the Messiah, the son of David, and this Messiah, the son of Joseph, Mashiach ben David was the reigning king, and Mashiach ben Yosef was the suffering servant, they could never dream that the two would become one and the same, and that he would come in humility and in weakness so that he could actually, in his solidarity with our condition, take our sins upon us and then give us his righteousness, best deal you'll ever get. And he came in that humility, but the next time he comes, it will be in great power and glory, and every eye will see him. And so we see that day, I believe, drawing near, and therefore what kind of people ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness as we look forward to and hasten the coming of the day of God, on account of which the heavens will burn with fervent heat and the earth will be burned. So we see all these things will be burned up. Why is it that men give themselves in their hearts in, in pursuit of a bucket of mammon that God promises he's going to burn up? And then they, 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 they overlook the things that matter most, human beings, people, the people that God's embedded in our lives. These are eternal beings. And the, our, the, the life of, the, of, this, of this world is like a life of a gnat in comparison with them. That's, it's people, it's eternal beings. It's immortal beings whom you, as C.S. Lewis says, that you um, talk with and uh, play with and marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal beings or um, eternal horrors. So uh, there's a holiness about the person that who knows Christ, and there is a presence of Christ in him that is also it resonates with his presence in you, so that we have a basis for unity in our diversity that's very rich and profound. So they, all these things about the Passover, the service, and there's not been such celebrated a Passover like it in Israel since the days of Samuel the prophet. We're talking about hundreds of years. How could it be? I wonder how he put up with them. Again, because they're radical disobedience and rebellion. And God keeps on saying, even now, there's still a hope if you would only return to me, even in the 11th hour when he sent all these prophets before the Babylonian exile, and these pre-exilic prophets like um, Jeremiah and others who then said warning to the people, Isaiah, and they, they, they would not receive it. So it's this whole picture then, this, this wonderful uh, portrait of the Passover. Um, I want to go, call your attention to one other thing. Yeah, remember we talked about these kings, uh, Israel's 20 rulers. And then I want to focus here, because what we're about to see as we go into chapter, Josiah dies in battle. But then, whammo, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, and then Jehoiakim rule. And so you have one succession of, after another of, of, so there was Manasseh and Ammon, wicked kings. Josiah, where does he come from? Um, and then his descendants, relentlessly evil, and with these last four, bring down the downfall of the kingdom. So these three are coming, and then Zedekiah would be the last of the kings, the last of the rulers who would be there. So there is a sadness to see its demise and how each one of them brought them further and further away. And as a consequence, what God promised has now taken place. The captivity in Babylon begins. Nebuchadnezzar ultimately has the house of the Lord destroyed, and all of these things then take place. And um, the articles of the house and of the treasures of the house of the Lord, the, house, the treasures of the king, they're all brought to Babylon. So all about, it's very detailed about the fact that the, the, all the treasures of that temple were gone. And now, what are you? And so all the days of its desolation, it kept Sabbath until 70 years were complete. So the 70, 490 years they were in the land, they never had a sabbatical year, by the way. And remember, they were commanded to have a, a year of Sabbath where they would not, not work. They never did it. So the land not, got its Sabbath. For every, every year, every, every, so you have 490 years divided by seven. That's why you have 70 years in captivity. The land enjoyed its Sabbath. You can pay me now, you can pay me later. You see, but ultimately God's going to be the one, his word will win out. Wouldn't it be prudent? Wouldn't it have been wonderful? Wouldn't it have been wise if they'd only, if they'd only taken that risk and took risks to do it, to believe that God would provide them enough that he would take care of them in that sabbatical year where they were not to plant, they were not to work. What, it was a, what that year was about, it was a sabbatical year and that's where we get the idea of a sabbatical.
Well, they never did it, let alone the year of Jubilee when everything went back to its original. It was like a game of Monopoly. You got Boardway, Bo Boardwalk and Park Place. The other guy's got, he's a slumlord in Baltic and Mediterranean. <laughs> but then the, go, then the board goes clear and every, everything goes back in the box. And now it's, everyone's back at go with, two, with, with their 1,700 bucks and they're back at go. You know, it's like the game of Monopoly. Win, 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 acquire, acquire, acquire. And then the second thing is when the game is over, everything goes back in the box. That's a picture of life, is it not? Everything goes back in the box. So what will endure is this idea. So he calls us, he, the, the, the sadness then is that they, they, um, they, they, they're decline. But then there is a Cyrus that God uses to actually fulfill the word by, of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. But that year, that sabbatical year, I go back to it because you know what it was meant to be? Relationships. You were to enjoy, and God, I'll, pro I'll provide for you. Take the risk, and I'll do it. And I'll, that, I will provide for all your needs, and you will spend a year becoming more intimate with me and with, your, with, with people. It was a year of relationships. Had they only done that, it would have energized and animated their soul. That's why I, I talk in Recalibrate Your Life um, the, about having an annual recalibration, at least, and where you're going to go and re revisit this. And that's what they were meant to do. We were meant to have a Shab Sabbath. Without Shabbat, there's no Shalom. You see, you need to have peace, uh, but peace comes from Sabbath, from rest. From finding our, our and finding our vitality in Him, not from being so harrowed and hurried that we become, at the end of the day, um, human doings. Yeah, yeah. This is not the way it was meant to be. Um, so, um, those are some th thoughts. What what, what concepts uh, thoughts do you have? The way the books were organized in the Jewish Bible, whatever you have, they're all the scriptures. What was um, it's interesting that the gospel writers tapped into that point, but how it think culturally that must have really uh, adversely influenced. Yes, the last verse of the Old Testament uh, in in, Mal in our it would have been Chronicles there, but here, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. Okay. See, so there's really the Old Testament revealed something that um, could not be attained by human endeavor. It, it was, it was, remember, Paul says, it was a schoolmaster to drive us to grace. It was a tutor to drive us to the realization, you can't do this. And, you, and when you finally admit you can't do it, then you, he's ready to do it in your behalf. And so that's a, always the need to come to the end of ourselves, isn't it? Uh, what was, there was another, another comment or question? I've been watching Chosen. Yes, The Chosen, uh-huh. I love it. Uh, but a lot of it, I'm sure, is just the wider scope uh, because a lot of it doesn't come from the Bible based on the Bible. But I would love to get your thoughts. Have you seen it? Yes, I've seen um, Current with The Chosen. And um, I have to say, it took me a couple of sessions to get into it because you're kind of trying it out and so forth. But then I began to realize, yes, they're taking a lot of speculative moves but none of them that were impossible to have occurred, and they know that, so they're taking that. But it, it gave us a picture, and some, for example, I think of Nathaniel when he um, has that vision, and he was, in, the, in this he was giving up a dream of being an architect, it's an interesting. It made it more real, I have to say, there are certain moments where first of all, you see the humor of Jesus, you see him laugh, you see something that often we don't see, and there's something, and he's also not, some kind of Aryan Jesus, the typical thing that you see in, uh, in, in films and, and images. Uh, that he, he was actually, uh, he was Jewish. We have to remember that. Um, and as a result of that, um, this, this is a good figure for that, but it's a, and I love the way it develops the disciples and their uniqueness and so forth. Um, um, it appears that um, Matthew is on the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, the, and the actor is. It's an amazing thing what they've done. But I have to say I was deeply moved by certain moments. His healing of the leper and the, uh, his ministry to the woman at the well and the wedding at Cana. Very powerful. I found myself moved deeply. 
So that's what I find to be the good part. So that's, uh, it, it's really very valuable. Yeah. Now you have to be aware though that the, that angel, um, that, uh, what's it called? Uh, Studio angel Studios is, is actually uh, LDS, uh, Mormon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you, that, but the, that doesn't mean the people who are doing this particular program, but they're using, they're in conjunction with that. Um, but let me say, it presents the gospel. And it's like this, if I, I, if I gave the Jesus in his own words to a Mormon, they would look at it. It would seem okay to them because they don't know their own theology very well. So if it actually would lead them to Jesus, and I've given it to Mormons as a result. In fact, my friend, who, a friend of mine has, a, has two boutique hotels in Baton Rouge, and they're Marriott hotels. So that they have, the, instead of in the books, what do they have in their drawer? Book of Mormon. But he is the owner of these, so he's now bought 2,000 copies of Jesus in his own words, and he puts them on top of the Book of Mormon in the drawers. <laughs> I just think that's, and it has a, has a little card in it that says effectively, take one, take this with you. Just fa I, it's just fabulous. It's a delicious thing, because if I can only get people to hear the words of Jesus straight up, it's a very powerful thing. To hear him, and uh, not secondary, second uh, hand stuff, without any Christianese. And so it's just a clear, straight up picture, and the only, and it's in red, and then the black words are only clarifying and contextualizing. But, and it just reveals him and builds up from who he is and his purpose and so forth to his, his views in the last time, and then his offer of salvation. It's a very good thing. I would invite you, by the way, I feel prompted to share that. It would be a good thing for you to consider um, giving to people. I always have a, a few copies of it with me wherever I go. And uh, it's, a, it's a powerful resource to give to people because it has... So if I go at the end, at the, at the end of the last chapter here, is, is the last of the chapters is his teachings on the end times. And so there, there are lots of white space and, 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 and an illustration in each of the short little chapters. And it's a nice little book to give to people. I gave it to one person who was a nominal Muslim, and I asked him about oh, three weeks later if he had uh, read it. He's, he owns a restaurant I go to, and he said, oh, I like this book very much. Can I have another one? So here's a guy who's going to give it to another person. He's my evangelist. I mean, but you see what I'm going to Just expose him to the words of Jesus, his teachings on the end times, and then his offer of salvation. And then at the end of it, there is a confessing faith in Jesus. So it's very simple. So I, uh, this is one of the things I gave to uh, my brother-in-law before his conversion. And that had an, so he wanted me to be sure I brought copies for him. So please do consider this is a tool I always, I only give them when I'm prompted to do so. So I would invite you, consider this thoughtfully, that you carry it with you in your, in your bag or have one with you. And if you are prompted to do it, you give it to someone. And it'll have, I think, you don't know, it can have an incalculably diffusive impact on the lives of others.